Hello there, um, my name is Maike. Can you hear me like this? Yes. Oh, perfect, okay. Um, so uh, let me outline what you can expect from the next uh, 30 minutes. So this lecture deals with the um, digital divide uh, from a software perspective. So um, I'm going to talk about what the digital uh, divide is all about. So, um, in short, uh, digital divide or digital inclusion, as many say today, uh, these terms describe that poor country, thank you, um, developing countries uh, do not have um, access to information and communication technologies, especially to the internet, and uh, this is seen as an obstacle for development and for economical growth. So I know at first glance it does not sound pretty comprehensible why access to the internet should help to fight poverty because uh, this is what, it, what it's all about. Um, so, but the whole matter becomes a little more clear when taken into account that today it is not so much uh, material goods anymore, uh, but non-material goods, information and knowledge, uh, which are much contested trade commodities and which are very important sources of um, wealth and power. So, and not having access to the internet equals exclusion from markets and equals exclusion from uh, important information of any kind, be it health information or be it political information, you name it. Um, all right, I'm going to give uh, some basics on free software, on open source, as you like it. And uh, I'm going to explain uh, why free software uh, has a lot of great potential to uh, induce a more even distribution of uh, wealth and to let more uh, people participate in the so-called digital age. Uh, I'm going to talk a little about uh, Brazil's IT policy because they are very active in promoting uh, free software in digital divide issues. I heard someone call them uh, the open source nation, so that's a pretty good compliment. And I am going to give some basics on intellectual uh, property rights and I want to explain what they have to do with the digital divide. And yeah, and I'm going to talk about some difficulties uh, free software faces as well. Uh, okay, so um, before I get started, one more thing. I know there are lots of discussions going on whether to use the term free software or whether to use the term open source. So since this lecture is not the place to discuss this issue, so I just use both terms equally. Okay, some more uh, background information. Uh, I spent a while in a very poor region of this world. I lived and worked in Latin America for a while, uh, in Nicaragua, for example, and I um, taught web design there, so I take interest in these issues. I have a background in uh, cultural sciences, and I actually wrote my master's thesis about the digital divide and software because I noticed a pretty big contradiction, and that was that on the one hand, you have hackers, programmers, and they say, yeah, we should use free software, that's a great idea, and it has a lot of, has a lot of advantages to help uh, to let more people participate in communication technologies, and they have very good reasons for their attitude. But on the other side, you have all the people who actually shape this policy issue of the digital divide. So you have NGO staff, lots of NGOs out there who deal in digital divide issues. You have local government entities, uh, policy makers, and, and they just do not have um, software or open source, um, especially on their agenda. So I wanted to find out the reasons for this big uh, contradiction. So I had uh, contact to the free software scene in uh, Latin America and I did uh, qualitative interviews with them. And I don't want to bore you with details about qualitative interviewing. If you're interested, you can download my master's thesis. I put it all down there. You can download it on um, my blog is fair-code.net. You find it there. So the basic idea about social research interviews is if you want to know why a certain problem is how it is, or you want to find out something about a situation, so why not talk to people who deal in these issues every day? 
And that's what I did. Uh, I talked to Federico Heinz, and he's a speaker of the Free Software Foundation. He's from Argentina, and he focuses on uh, the digital divide and on sustainable development. Second person I interviewed, that was Fernanda Wyden. She's a free software programmer. She works for IBM Brazil. She's Brazilian. But she also counsels the Brazilian government and civil society groups on migrating on IT matters. Um, third person I interviewed, that was Beatrice Buzanich, and she has a background in uh, communication uh, sciences. And uh, she's a free software activist, and she took part at the World Summit on the Information Society. Okay. Um, so when we talk about this digital divide, that is not just one divide between on and offliners. In fact, it's more like a whole complex. So in this lecture, I talk about the global digital divide, and uh, that signifies, you know, the differences between countries that are online and countries that are offline. So, and since we have a great north-south divide in our world, so for the most part, citizens of the northern countries, richer countries, are online, while citizens from poor and developing countries are mostly offline. And uh, part of this uh, digital divide complex is as well the social divide, and this signifies differences uh, between on- and offliners within the same country, uh, we have a gender divide as more men than women surf the net. Uh, we, have a, we have a divide, uh, I never can pronounce this word rural, it's R-U-R-I-L, or I might just say countryside. So because you have, of course, <laughs> a much better and, uh, you know, more bandwidth in cities than you have on the countryside. Uh, uh, language barriers are an important part of this uh, whole problem. Uh, since I th approximately 80% uh, of the web content is written in English, but that is a language that is roughly understood by maybe one in 10 people worldwide. So this excludes then, of course, a lot of people. Um, then we have a democratic divide, and this signifies differences between people who do use digital resources to make their voices heard in political processes and uh, people who do not do this, who do not have the chance to do this. And on a more practical level, of course, you have you know, a lack of uh, bandwidth, uh, hardware, appropriate software, computer skills. Uh, and what's a very important um, issue as well is that in developing nations, in poor countries, you often have uh, extremely high costs for an internet connection. Okay, so what has access to information and uh, communication technologies to do uh, with uh, development? I said uh, some words in the beginning about this um, issue. So um, since the mid-1990s, uh, the Internet became a mass medium. And shortly after, the digital divide appeared on the political uh, agenda because people noticed a very sad uh, continuation. And uh, that was that um, so while in the industrial age, uh, although most of the material resources are located in the southern hemisphere, um, citizens of poor and developing nations have not benefited from the situation because for the most part, the exploitation of these material resources is and was located by the richer countries, respectively by their corporations. Um, so, and in the so-called digital age, the situation simply continues uh, because um, non-material goods, information and knowledge, and uh, systems that take care of the distribution of non-material goods they are again controlled by the richer countries. So while people from the north, from the richer countries, do have access, uh, people from the south are excluded. So, so much for the background of the sole uh, policy issue. Okay, uh, free software, uh, open source software. Um, one question, may I have a microphone in my hand, is that possible? That would be great. Okay. Thank you. Uh, 
Okay, perfect. So otherwise I just uh, fight drain my heart, so this is much more convenient now. Um, all right, so uh, free software, open source software uh, is having, you know, its very own economics, very own culture, very own values, and it's completely different to the world of proprietary software, which for the most part means uh, Windows, of course, and you can trace this being so different uh, from the free software is uh, that oh, you have like four characteristics so that make up for this being so different from free software from open source. So and the first characteristic is that the software can be run for any purpose. Second one is uh, source code is freely accessible and it can be modified and maybe used for educational purposes. Third one is that the software can be distributed and copied without restrictions. And fourth one is that it can be distributed and copied in modified versions. And that's, of course, completely different if you compare that to proprietary software. And on this slide, I just put down very, you, the most basic differences you have between these two models of treating code, of software models. So while with free software, you do have access to source code, some words on source code. I believe that most people in this uh, room do know about source code, but maybe there's someone who doesn't. So source code is like the DNA of software, and if you want to make uh, modifications, you only can do it if you have access to source code. You do not have access to source code with proprietary software, and while with free software, the business model is based on providing service since you give away uh, the software, the product for free. Completely different case in proprietary software, so they generate their profit by selling licenses, but of course they charge for support. Okay, and the last one I talked about that, so free software licenses allow free distribution and modification of software, so the GPL is like the most prominent and brilliant license we have there. Um, so, and uh, with proprietary um, software, so that's just not allowed. Um, all right. Um, so now I'm going to switch on intellectual property rights and software, which means patents and uh, copyrights, because that is very closely linked. Um, I want to say something about uh, Brazil, uh, because um, they, Brazil is the country that has explicitly promoted uh, free software open source in recent years. So they integrated into programs aiming at bridging the digital divide and they are in the process of migrating their own public IT infrastructure. They do all kinds of things. Uh, and this pro-Linux policy is closely linked with um, arguments concerning intellectual property rights. So because developing and poor nations, they have been complaining for years that the existing um, IPR systems do not work for their benefit, but rather reflect the interests uh, of uh, the, the richer world, of the developed um, countries. Mm, so poor countries say that, you know, strong IP intellectual property rights, or maybe we should say like classic intellectual property rights systems, they say that this actually hinders them in their development. Uh, to make this point more clear, I'm going to say some words behind the idea of intellectual property, but not a lot, because after this lecture, Carsten will do a lecture about this, and so he will go into this uh, in, much, in uh, much more detail. Uh, so the original idea behind intellectual property is there's nothing wrong with that. It's uh, pretty understandable. So innovators and creative people, they create something, they make something new, and then they are rewarded with a temporary, the R noise again, with a timely limited uh, monopoly. And this allows them to charge far higher prices than they could if there was uh, competition. So bad thing is then that follow-up innovations decelerate, they are much slower. But the idea is that, you know, society as a whole does benefit because intellectual property rights system are supposed to create an incentive for innovation. So they are supposed, uh, you know, to encourage people to innovate. 
to create new things. So problem is just that in the last 20, 30 years, uh, we have seen a massive extension of intellectual property rights because today you can put a patent or copyright on everything and that is completely new. So you know you can put a patent on plants, on mathematical algorithms, um, on human genes. And the problem with this is that today it is not so much the best ideas that uh, succeed, but it's more um, so very expensive lawyers that uh, get through. And in the case of developing nations, that's even more uh, urgent because developing nations, they hardly own patents, they hardly own copyrights, and very important, they really lack uh, the means to enforce them because enforcing a patent, for example, is extremely costly. Um, so, and in the end, this all means that computer jobs or technologies, they are only for people who, you know, have the money to buy licenses and to buy the patents. Um, and uh, as I um, pointed out, because free software, open source, is having very different models on um, intellectual property, so developing nations actually benefit from this very special concept that is behind it because it's much more open. And now I have slides prepared uh, that uh, explain the actual advantages that uh, free software offers, which proprietary software uh, cannot offer. Um, so first one is a skill transfer. Uh, since you have access to source code uh, with GNU Linux, um, this offers um, interactive access to knowledge and information engineering skills of the most developed countries. So people from economically disadvantaged regions, um, they can you know, learn locally and obtain new skills and all of this at very, very low cost. And the philosophy and mechanisms of the free software community imply that someone who is a learner today uh, can be a teacher tomorrow. And these newly learned skills, they can help uh, to find a job or to sustain small businesses. And in addition, the so-called uh, brain drain can be counteracted. And brain drain, that's a problem that all the developing nations uh, suffer from. And this means that talented people, in this case uh, programmers, um, they have to leave their home country because they, do, they cannot find adequate education facilities um, or jobs in their own countries, so they have to leave. But with uh, open source, since you have this very special development model and everything, you just can take part in a very ambitious you know, software developing um, uh, project and just stay in your country. Um, second point is price and uh, total cost of ownership. Uh, so when you take, for example, a country like uh, Vietnam, um, working with proprietary systems, so let's, let's take Windows XP uh, together with Office, that equals in a country like Vietnam, maybe like 16, um, or that is worth of 16 months worth salary. And with GNU Linux, uh, you just have the um, distribution costs. Uh, so critics, uh, uh, critics argue all the time that installation and support, that costs a lot of money and that it's hard to calculate. So that is a point, but, um, or why TCO is an issue, um, so, but we always have to take into account uh, that developing nations, or in developing nations, labor is not a big cost factor. And much more importantly, you always can promote your local software market. And just never forget that proprietary software uh, also needs support that is costly. Uh, okay, then we have the complex of uh, technological independence. Um, So um, a great proportion of uh, proprietary software is developed in the richer world, so respectively uh, controlled by their big corporations. Problem here is uh, that um, the mere import of software intensifies the very dependencies which are supposed to be overcome. And this has all to do with the fact that software is a very special good, so it is more uh, a process than a product. And in order to keep it usable, you um, 
need to develop it continuously, you need updates, uh, you need upgrades, um, and uh, which means that you know support updates and upgrades they have to be uh, bought continuously. And uh, in the proprietary software world, it is a fairly common business model to initially sell software at a loss or even to give it away for free in order to develop a user base. And uh, then if you have this user base, prices just go up and the customers just cannot switch easily to other uh, software solutions because the data is locked in the proprietary system. And so as a result, uh, customers have uh, to pay premium prices. And you do not have this problem by using free software, open source. Another advantage is that uh, GNU Linux operating system, they run on pretty old uh, computers. And problem with proprietary operating systems is, you know, when you take Windows, they always rely on the newest processor generation. Um, and this is, or therefore, they are pretty useless for owner of an older and therefore poorly performing IT infrastructure. And companies cease to offer support for older proprietary system, for older operating system. So that is like the case for Windows 95, Windows 98, uh, Windows um, NT. But with free software, with open source, uh, since source codes are available and provided that computer specialists um, are around that know the system, you can support the system as long as the hardware works. And this very costly race where um, the newest software requires the newest hardware, you just don't have to play uh, this game now. Um, okay, so in this whole complex of technological independence, uh, free standards, protocols, and data formats, they are very um, important because if you have openness, you have competition, uh, which presents monopolistic tendencies, uh, and that's good because then you have options and choices because monopolies, they're always equal dependencies, and that is actually what the poor countries are trying to get rid of. Localization, sorry. All right, so localization is another um, advantage open source offers which proprietary software cannot offer because I think we have on this planet close to 7,000 languages and I don't know how many writing systems. And closed source software is only produced in those um, languages that promise to be economically uh, profitable. Um, so, and you cannot make changes concerning language um, uh, because you do not have the source code. And so in the end, this closes computer jobs and certain technologies to people who, for example, understand English. And this also makes basic computer training uh, difficult and sometimes expensive. So, and again, with free software, uh, you have the source code, and so that offers the opportunity to translate the software into any, into any language uh, you need. Um, the last two points, I'm going to make them quickly because that is not so very special on this whole digital divide issue. Security is an issue because um, free software open source does have a reputation of uh, being more secure and uh, transparency is important. So this whole trusted or so-called trusted uh, computing debate is important here, but because if you do not have um, uh, the source code, so this makes uh, software a black box and you never can see if, for example, the right of privacy is uh, violated, yes or no, or if everything is fine. And so with uh, free software, you just can look everything up and there will always be people if something should be wrong, they will fix it. So in this sense, um, it is a very uh, democratic kind of code. Okay, so I, then now I mentioned some uh, pretty impressive um, advantages why free software open source does offer a lot of great advantages when it comes to bridging the digital divide. So uh, how come that free software is definitely not mainstream? So what Brazil is doing here, that's clearly the exception of the rule. And then there are two very um, obvious reasons. The first one is that Microsoft was their first 
of course, and most people are being born into a Windows world, and if you just take into account usability aspects, there's nothing wrong with Windows, but if you um, take into account some other uh, issues, there are some things completely wrong with uh, closed source or with Microsoft um, systems. The second pretty obvious reason is why open source is not mainstream in digital divide issues is that, of course, someone uh, who's not having the financial means to buy the license, so he just used illegally copied software. So, and I believe that is not just a problem or a thing that people in developing nations do. So I know quite some Germans who uh, choose the same way. Um, and then there are lots of reasons that are not so obvious, uh, but these reasons also explain why open source free software is not mainstream when it comes to um, these issues. And that is that software policy just uh, serves uh, as a blind spot. So the activists um, I talked to, they all reported of this very um, common experience that um, the people who take part in this uh, policy issue digital divide, they talk about everything. So how they are supposed to build up a physical IT infrastructure and or how they should, um, or how, you know, providing people with ICTs can help to promote democratization and living standards, but they just don't think of software, so they just never have thought about this whole software uh, policy um, issue, uh, which is a mistake because, as I pointed out, free software does offer certain advantages which proprietary software cannot um, offer. and. So software deserves to be, very clearly, to be an issue because software is, you know, it's a central component of information and uh, communication technologies. It serves as an interface between man and machine and software controls data flows and therefore it also controls, uh, to a certain extent, human behavior. So, um, but when it comes to this digital divide debate, people just don't have software on their agenda, and uh, this uh, situation is having a lot to do with this virtual and technological character of software. So the activists I talked to, um, they said that it's very, it's not so easy to uh, explain to someone who lacks um, a technological background just to explain this um, issue or the concept of source codes and all these things. Um, so, and the main or the most important point here is that software is not just about code, but it's about right, control, and freedom, security, and power relations, all these things. Yeah. Just a remark. Uh, Microsoft wasn't only their first. Yeah. I think the problem is that their um, distribution people have... Uh, know how to influence the decision makers in corporations. All right, yeah, that's a very important uh, point because, you know, uh, when, when it comes to policy issues, you have lobbyism. So as it is in this world, it is not that, you know, the best ideas or the best software model succeeds, but it's very often, you know, who has uh, resources to pay the best lobbyists and they have the ears of the politicians. So that is a, another very um, big problem, right? Okay, so why is free software open source not mainstream? We have uh, uh, economical and cultural reasons for the situation as well, because uh, free software open source does not fit into classic economy and it does not fit into classic value systems. And this has to do with the fact that uh, free software or free code, that is a phenomenon with a lot of different uh, aspects and size, so because it can be commercial, it can be non-commercial, and it's, it is developed by, indi by individuals that are scattered all around the world, and they still work together, and then you have uh, large corporations involved, but often you do not have regular superiors, 
and for outsiders of this uh, system that is just very hard to understand. And all in all, the principle of organization, um, the development model, economy and values these people have who do this kind of uh, software that often causes uh, suspicion. So and the most, or my most favorite story about making clear so why there's suspicion, so uh, Georg Greve told it to me, and uh, he's uh, president, president of the Free Software Foundation Europe, and he was once um, invited to some high-class policy congress, and the organizers there asked him to please be last in line to do his lecture because they feared that his GNU Linux presentation could destroy the Beamer. And stories that, that lag, that is just not an is exception, so that just <laughs> happens all the time. And this results in the fact that people who do um, lobby or you know, public relations for free software, they spend a great share of their time just in trying to kill prejudices and to create trust. But there's really uh, no need to be uh, suspicious because uh, this being so different to classic economy or this being so different uh, to, um, to classic values, that all has to do with the nature of non-material goods and that all has to do with the nature of digital data spaces because non-material goods, they grow by sharing and that is of course completely different to the physical world and so information grows if you let others participate and in digital data spaces this one main uh, condition of economics does not apply and that is that there is just no shortage uh, and uh, all free software programmers do is just they take advantage of this characteristics that the digital media or non-material uh, goods offer. So just don't be afraid. Uh, how much time do I have left? Okay. Ten minutes? Okay, so... Uh, some more reasons why free software open source hardly plays a role when it comes to bridging the digital divide. So I said a little, some words on this um, because of your question. So in the public sector, as I said, so you have lots of lobbyism. And so uh, Microsoft plays a key role here, of course. So I don't know the exact number, but they have an extremely huge budget just to do lobbying. And uh, I don't know. Uh, for example, what the budget is of the Free Software Foundation to do, to do lobbying, but I think it's, uh, you, you just cannot compete with Microsoft in these um, issues. And then, as I said, you know, um, there are lots of NGOs out there, civil society groups who deal in digital divide related issues, and in order to work, they depend on funding, on sponsors. And uh, again, so this is often or uh, very often so free software community cannot um, you know provide this uh, um, in a, in a <laughs> now the words are lacking <laughs> um, so what, what, what I want to say is that so of course Microsoft is having much greater resources to satisfy these needs and then there's another reason that, of course, there are NGOs out there who say that they value free software and they say, yeah, we see it's having great potential and we would love to use it, but, you know, we just cannot teach skills that the local labor market is not demanding, so that's the point. Okay, and then we have some internal reasons, of course, so, um, and this, the support theme, that's the all-time evergreen, um, so free software people always say, no, 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 we have great support, you know, either you have a, a company who gives you support and if you do not have that for the software solution you are in need, so just go into the internet and you will find documentation and you will find people who help you, internet fraud or whatever, because that is, you know, the core of this whole free software community. Problem is just that people who are not used to these kind of working structures, they are kind of confused because they are 
uh, used to work with fixed structures and they want to have fixed responsibilities while the message of free software is completely different so you have to do some things on your own and they have this network character and this is often not uh, often for example the public sector um, companies they say no this is not suitable for us we just want to have clear responsibilities uh, usability is an aspect so of course there are really great um, free software pieces out there that are just great concerning usability just take whatever Debian based uh, operating system uh, Knopix, Ubuntu, Kubuntu they're great uh, Firefox, of course, everyone knows this one, and so, but you still have lots of open source projects out there where I often have the uh, impression that the people who did this, they had themselves in mind as an intended audience and not people who just want to uh, use the software. And all this, no, that, that is such a sad point, so where are the girls? So, again, here, I think computer IT, that's like, almost like an all-male um, Thing. I read once a study and they found out that on the developer side you have like 1.1 women, so rest is all male, and on the user side I think uh, this is not much better, so which is sad because I mean very few women decide to join the free software community, you know, to bring their skills in there, to learn, to pass their knowledge on. Um, so, but I would say that we have uh, responsibilities there on both sides, so why this is just not working out fine. Hello? Ah, uh, you can find the women, or part of them, on uh, the IRC server free node in Debian Women. <laughs> I, I can't find what there? The women. <laughs> I know there are some, <laughs> but I wouldn't say that the women are the, the majority here, just, I mean, look around, so. Okay, so, but uh, since um, there are a lot of uh, great advantages why free software is of great use, um, so I just put some uh, reasons down, so what helps to make free software open source mainstream, this is, of course, you know, just write great software. Um, but I think this is maybe, you know, like 50% just having good software. The other 50% is really just to raise awareness. So the activists I talked to in these interviews um, I made, so they really say that you just uh, spend so much time just on, you know, bringing up this issue and to explain it to outsiders. Um, and this is very important. You know, and then of course convince the NGOs, convince the CSOs, talk to them because, and of course convince the policy makers uh, because they do all the decisions. And since we have this divide between people with a technological background who have all this great knowledge, valuable knowledge, and they have to somehow try to get their knowledge out of their community to the people who actually make the decisions. Of, integrate more women, I said that, and then what would be a good idea um, as well as, you know, win free software companies as sponsors for digital divide initiatives. So I know that um, Red Hat is pretty active there in Asia, especially in India, and so you can see that in this region of the world, um, open sources as well, gaining um, market share and everything. Another reason would uh, be, you know, so um, uh, just copy the Brazilians because Brazilians did a great job, so they are very far ahead. So, but uh, I might can talk about this later since uh, time is running out. Just uh, one more thing is that does free software, does open source equal uh, development and growth? Well, of course not. So it should be seen. Um, as a means to an end, not as an end in itself to have people online. And it's as well of very little use just to say, hey, poor countries, look, we have free software, it's so great, it's for free, just use it. So this is just not going to work. So there have to be local structures um, that secure the maintenance and the development and the use of free software. Uh, of open source. And one more thing I want to say that this whole digital divide debate is 
really, um, so I'm pretty critical about this, so I think, yes, it, it should be an issue. It is important since access to information is very important and it can help to promote, you know, more sustainable development. Um, but what I see, or oh, I've read lots of books um, around it, and so I often had the impression that the people who work in these issues, they kind of think that, you know, uh, provide poor people with an internet account equals um, development and economic growth. And this is definitely not the case. So it can help in a lot of cases, but it shouldn't be an ideology. Okay, so thank you for your attention, and if there are questions... So I just want to say I think that you're right and that free and open source software oh, by here. I think that free and open source is a part of the solution, but I don't agree with everything you've said. I mean you said that software cost was a big part of the problem in developing countries, but Microsoft can and does offer vastly reduced prices for poor countries. There's also the fact that many people don't even have power, they don't have internet access. So I don't think that's the whole solution. And as far as preventing brain drain from these companies, I don't think that op open source software will do that. I mean, sure it provides an opportunity for people to contribute to something, but as far as making money, the, contributing to the development of Linux is not going to make me money. And the companies that are offering support and making the money, those are hiring people who have university educations. And the brain drain is most important when you're losing the best people, the most intelligent, the brightest people. And those are the people who will continue to go to the developed countries that have the universities. And so until we get universities, university programs, open source software can't stop the brain drain. Thank you. Uh, so th my goal here was not to say that we have to have everything using free software. So the point is that I want to make is that in this whole digital divide debate, people just do not talk or hardly talk about software issues at all. And that is, I think, a very big mistake. Um, so, and uh, the, the other uh, thing you said that, uh, that the, the brain drain cannot be counteracted. So, um, I think uh, it does offer certain advantages because, you know, if you want to use the free software, you have very, uh, you want to work with free software, you have very low barriers because if you just want to try out um, information technology and if you want to, you know, mess around with source code, you want to do that with proprietary software, you need to um, buy, uh, you know, very costly licenses and everything. And so you have very high barriers then. And if you just want to try it out and get into it, so why not start with free software because you have very low barriers. And this openness, I think it's a very, very great advantage. And this is actually, of course, the whole uh, philosophy that made... Um, the internet, you know, become a success story, you, you find this again in the mechanisms of the free software community because the reason why um, the internet became such a mass medium is because everything was open, you know, we had open protocols and so every, everyone just, you know, could mess around and um, do things with it and you have the same, and it became a success story, and you have the same mechanisms and philosophy um, with uh, free software. So you have very low barriers just to get started. Um, you said that uh, just implementing free software and giving people internet access does not equal economic growth. Um, well, of course that formula would be too simple, but I would imagine that having access to something like the internet for people who have needs would bring, um, w would have a lot of developments following because they could, if they wanted, just run schools because all the material is there. If, of course, the language barrier is down a little, if there is some kind of um, internet language spoken, they could just do that or they could research on whatever they wanted. And I, would, I wanted to know, are there any studies, have there any been, uh, has there been field work 
on projects where communities have received internet and nothing else has happened or, um, well, has there been any work on this? I know some projects in Africa, for example, and what they do is that, and, and there's an NGO, it's called Geek Corps, and so they set up, you know, uh, internet connections, and because in Africa, uh, a lot of people just do not uh, um, own uh, computers, but radios, so that, like, one person having an internet um, access point, and he got valuable information, whatever, health information, political information, and then he just, you know, had a radio show and, and just, um, you know, spread it around his area, so, and people can benefit from this in this or, you know, this uh, sense. But, you know, all what the whole digital divide thing is about, you know, um, promote democratization and better living standards. And that's very hard to measure how you, how you reach this by giving people access uh, to the net. But I think every, everyone knows that, you know, you can, with... Um, using the net, you can make your voice heard much better if you do not have access to the internet. So, and, but my criticism I, I, to, I talked about, because there are lots of failed aid programs and the activists I um, talked to, they reported of um, some programs, digital divide programs, so where they provided lots of computers to uh, the countryside, to very poor regions, but the people there didn't even have electricity, and so no one just talked about this, uh, or no, no one thought about this, so they, they are very, the concepts are lacking, so I think we have to be careful with that. There are lots of failed programs out there. I'd like to comment um, on, the, um, yeah, on the issue, I'm here. <laughs> I'd like to comment on the issue that um, developing free and open source softwares in um, developing countries uh, wouldn't help them um, to earn money or to avoid the brain drain. I think the opposite could be the case. Um, if we can get more of these guys on board to helping to develop, then they share more parts of the code and so they uh, have more possibilities to get hired to implement new features or fix stuff or do consulting. You don't have to be um, on site all the time. You can, it, can perhaps sometimes do it from remote and I think that's a new chance. Um, I guess most of you who have developed uh, open source software had this situation where they get asked to program some more for money and um, to take this one step further, there's a company called uh, JBoss, and they have a concept like professional open source where they hire contributing developers full time and they don't require them to move in another country. So um, if you make yourself uh, heard and visible in that community, the chances are quite high that you get hired with a Western standard um, pay uh, even from Africa or China or something like that and you I think that way uh, you have a virtual uh, company and um, You can more evenly distribute the money over different countries So it's not no longer necessity to be in that Western country or that developed country It's, it's a very nice dream to say that companies with money can pay Western wages to people in Africa to develop the software, but the reality is that it's being outsourced to India and you can get people with a great education in India who are going to be able to have a much higher productivity than somebody who simply learned by looking at a few tutorials online. The reality is it's not equal. Okay, I don't know how many projects you have seen that have been successful from India that are very special kind of projects. Um, and it's not a dream, it's reality. Look at Jabos, look at whom they're hiring and look at at the guys and where they're working from. So that is, 
I agree that it's not, we haven't seen much of it yet. It st just starts to begin with open source and pro professional development of open source. But um, that's definitely a way to do it. Uh, I found it extremely interesting um, what what you were talking about, and I would ask if you can talk a little bit more about Latin America because I had the impression that with the, the government of Lula and the, the PT, it was it was not uh, anymore the, the situation that uh, nobody was talking about it, but that uh, open source free software was extremely pushed in a certain sense and. What happened in that uh, event? Do you want you, to know why? Yes, if you can, if you can talk why, why more Brazil? about what, what is happening in, in Brazil, for example, yeah. because I think it's an example where open, open source free software matters. Yeah. So um, the, they have a very active uh, free software open source scene, and they are very uh, politicized. So, and what they managed is, I think one of their success stories is that they really managed to integrate many non-hackers into the movement. So most of the time programmers, they program and they do not have so much interest in uh, policy issues, but they managed to integrate so people from social, social sciences, whatever, and so they, this whole thing st started on a state basis, so they have a federal system as well, and so they had close ties to the worker parties, um, and when they came to power, so they just knew the people, they had the ear of the politicians, and they have very great arguments for it, so they uh, succeeded. And another point, is, which I think is pretty important, is that they have at least a lot of female users. So, and of course, you know, um, if you want to make free software mainstream, but it's just the boys who use it, it's not going to become mainstream. But they manage, you know, to integrate more women and they work closely with policymakers. And so, but another thing is that what I, so they always often use the words of, you know, just using Windows, that is like a kind of electronic um, colonization. And we want to do our own things, we want to take care of our own business and we can do it. And so free software offers a lot of great opportunities in this uh, aspect. And one more thing about Brazil, so of course it is great to have strong ties to one party, which they had, and that, so what happens is, when Lula, the workers' party, they came into government, federal government, so they really called people there, um, there's an NGO or, you know, free software community there, they are called Projeto Software Libre, and they called them and say, so we want to migrate, can't you guys help, because you are the experts, we are politicians. And so this all got then pretty quick on the agenda and a lot of happened. Problem is just because now the Workers' Party is suffering from a corruption scandal and so chances are likely or chances are not good that this policy will continue when they have to step out of office because then you have again um, uh, you have so the other parties, conservative parties and they are often now just against free software, not because they know anything about it. It's more like a reflex, ah, workers' party is followed, so we have to be against it. So, and the people there are now very um, active or trying to convince, you know, the broader public and to convince other parties because they just don't want that. The end of the Lula government will be the end of the pro-free software uh, policy. I think, uh, yeah, so it's 2 p.m., so thank you. <laughs>